it's Emily Williams here, and we have quite the show for you today. We have relationship and intimacy expert Marla Mattinson here, and I'm going to introduce her and share a little bit about her, her work and her background, and then we're going to dive into some incredible content. So Marla is a seven-figure relationship and intimacy expert specializing and coaching entrepreneurial couples who have an urgent desire to transform both their relationship and their business. Using her neuroscience and mathematics background, Marla is uniquely gifted at working with couples to identify their negative habitual patterns. Over the course of her 22-year career, she's helped more than 12,000 couples, including Academy Award-winning actors, producers, and directors, NBA players and coaches, Grammy Award-winning artists, and millionaire entrepreneurs. Quite the experience. So welcome, Marla. That's amazing. Thank you so much. I'm super happy to be here, Emily. And so everyone knows I know about Marla's work firsthand because James and I spent nearly a year working with her on our relationship and growing in ways that um, I can't even begin to express, but I'm sure we're going to try to on this show today. So it's just an honor to have you here, Marla. Thank you. Thank you. So I think what people probably will want to know first and foremost is how do you go from working with something like neuroscience and in mathematics to working with couples? Yes. So... Actually, I was working with couples before the mathematics and neuroscience came in, and then I came back to working with couples. So in the early 90s, I was a doula helping women through labor and delivery of their babies and postpartum. So I coached couples on how to, you know, bring their child into the world and intimacy after you have a child, and also clearing karma for your incoming children. If you can imagine doing a little more work on yourself before your children come in, their load is a little lighter, right? So you're in a good good spot. And so after um, many, many years doing that work, I also ended up coaching couples just in general on the relationship. And then I ended up in a car accident driving on Topanga Canyon in Los Angeles, and I rolled my car down the hill. And most people in that situation die because that's what the firefighters told me. And I walked out without a scratch. And so it was a life changing event. It made me really stop and pause. What's important. What do I really want? What are my true desires? And I got the hit to go back to school and go to medical school. So I started as a chemistry major, and then I realized the parts I loved about chemistry were the math parts, and so I changed my major to math, and then I I got a degree in mathematics and neuroscience from UCLA, and I don't know why, I just had to continue on and do more math and got a master's degree in math at Claremont Graduate University, and I didn't even know I was good at math back then. It just literally was going by desire and what was coming through. And so I ended up getting a a, a few degrees. And then I ended up teaching high school math with inner city kids for seven years in Los Angeles Unified. And, And then I just like I get visions all the time, I got a vision that it's time to leave teaching and go back to working with co- with coaches and couples and working with business. And I had been doing a lot of business work along the way as well and working with families in business. And so I left the teaching profession and I hired a very high level coach to help me with my money mindset. And I ended up really blending everything together from my past everything from the doula work and the work, how do you help somebody through labor and delivery and the intensity of that and the neuroscience and the mathematics. It's like the way my brain works is just natural pattern recognition. I see it everywhere. So I can see when one person in in the relationships talks in one way and the other person is hearing it in a different way, I can see the pattern that can help them connect Mm. so they can hear and listen with the same, uh, on the same frequency basically. I love that. And I think part of that background makes your unique, your work so unique as a relationship and intimacy, intimacy expert. I don't know anyone kind of like pairing those two things together or those many things together. 
And I think it's an important um, lesson to learn for a lot of people because there are people who are in their 30s or 40s or 50s and looking to figure out like what the next chapter is for them. And they think that maybe they've wasted their time doing something that's not going to pertain to that next chapter, but you can actually kind of fuse everything together and it makes you much more resourceful and stronger and, you know, more capable of doing the work you're doing. I love that. That, So that, you know, that you know me so well. It speaks to my uh, philosophy of integration. We don't try to cut any parts away from ourselves. We integrate everything. And so instead of trying to say, oh, I don't want to do that thing anymore, or, oh, I don't like it when I get controlling, how can I instead love that part of myself and integrate it in? Like, oh, look, I'm in my controlling phase. That's okay. How long do I want to stay there, right? But to integrate everything, integrating the math, integrating the doula work, integrating everything that I've done in my life so that I can really fully be of service to so many people, right? And, you know, when you have a math and neuroscience background and a more logical approach, uh, it's really easy to relate to a wide range of people also. Yeah. And I know one of the things we're going to talk about today is the exquisite dark side. It's one of my favorite things that you teach. So we'll get to that in a second. But I want to talk to something that's not exactly tangible or practical first. So you roll the car down the hill. You should have died. You know, that's an incredible story. So I think people would love to know, and I'd love to hear it again. What was it that was calling you? You've mentioned visions already on the show, but what was it that that sort of called you to go in a different direction? And what is it that does so now, even today? Because I know you still follow those instincts. Can you describe that a little bit more? Yes, yes. This is, it's so personal to share. And um, I've shared it a few times. My clients know. What happened when I rolled down that hill was I heard a very clear message. I had an outer body experience where as the car was rolling down the hill, I was literally outside of the car, viewing, looking in through the rear window of the car. And I had the thought, if you won't walk the path, we're going to take you off this earth and bring back someone who will. And that message, I know it just hit me square in the center of my body. And when the car stopped rolling down the hill, because a big boulder stopped it from rolling completely down, it was actually this moment of total beauty where there was still some uh, gravel falling into the car. The windows were smashed. Um, there was the, the uh, stream down below and I could hear the water rushing. And then I thought, I got to get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> so it had a quick moment of beauty. But the vision was, I thought, what path? I'm on the path. I'm a doula. I do this all this beautiful healing work with babies. I teach infant massage. I'm a coach. What path? And <laughs> The path was go back to school and get this degree and go fit. And I thought, really, that's the path. Okay, fine. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do whatever. And so the next vision was give away your entire massage clientele. I had maybe 60 or 70 people rotating in my roster of massage clients. I gave all of my massage clients away. I only worked with babies. And then I signed up for school a month later. And it was very clear, walk the path. And the path meant listen to the guidance that's telling you where to go, not where not to go. So there's no fear involved. It's just, this is what it is Mm -hmm. and go in that direction and you will be taken care of. And that is still, as you said, true today where, um, I've had to make some very hard choices in terms of when I say yes to what's coming through me and that vision Oftentimes, that's a no for other things. That's yeah. closing the door on other people, places, things, events. You know, I don't even know why I say yes to things, except that the vision is saying that's a yes. Yep. And and that's what I and so now I have this pretty exquisite life. Yeah, I remember a few months ago you shared that you felt called and felt pulled to an event in New York City and you had this full calendar and you had to move all this stuff around to make it happen and you didn't even know why you were really being called to be there, but you made it happen and so many incredible things came from you being in that space. Oh, yes. And actually, I think this would be good for your listeners too. I would love to just share a little bit more about that story. Yeah, please. 
Okay, so I got an email. We all get emails. We're on all everybody's lists, right? Because it's really fun to see what everybody's doing. And yeah. so Selena Sue, who you, of course, know, you introduced me to her. Yeah. I was on her list, and she sent a very simple email. It had four events on it, and one of them was this event in New York. And it was just a big, yes, go to that. I didn't even know what it was about. So she connected me with Chris Winfield because I was like, hey, just so you know, I'm a yes. I just want to know more about what this event is. <laughs> That's what you I said, said on the phone. Yes. <laughs> he was the laughing hysterically. And so I went to the event, had an incredible experience, and got an article published in Entrepreneur Magazine after that. But the cool thing was on the way home, and you know this, on the flight home yeah. from New York, I sat next to the president of CBS Television and KCAL 9 in Los Angeles, and he sparked up a conversation with me. And long story short, he invited me to have a segment done on me uh, on local television in Los Angeles. So that's kind of a great story, right? You know, it's like, say yes to this thing. And if you're really listening, then you'll say yes and you'll take the action, you'll clear the calendar, you'll go. And all of these incredible things have happened. So say yes. When you get the yes, you have to also say the internal yes. Even though I have no idea how it's going to work, no idea how it's going to happen, it's a yes. I love that because it's a much more um, real, not real, but relatable example. You know, not all of us roll our car down a canyon. You know, <laughs> we don't ever desire to do that. But these little callings happen every single day. And so many of us ignore them or we think that's not practical. And, you know, I know we're going to talk about this later in the show as well. But you've also been given a column that you're writing regularly from for an entrepreneur because of that. Or it's kind of like, you know, this, this, um, th play, this whole what do you call it? All these events that have happened because of you saying yes, that's one of them, which is huge. And a lot of other things we don't need to go into, but like, it's just snowballed just because you said yes. Yes. And that's one example, right. Yeah. Of saying yes, because I've said yes to a number of other things and those have also bear yeah. fruit. And then I've said yes to other things. And seemingly right now, maybe it seems like there's nothing fruitful from the yes, but I, I never say that's true because what if next week or next month or next year something comes of that? And I expect that. I expect that everything I say yes to bears fruit at some point for me and others. And what would you say, um, since I do know you so well, I know that there have been times where you've said yes, and it's resulted in like being on, on TV, you know, that wasn't necessarily the easiest thing for you. I hope you're okay with me sharing this, <laughs> but like there, yeah. you know, it's not always easy when we say yes, sometimes we're stretching ourselves. And so what would you say to people when they say yes? And then all of a sudden it's like all this fear and anxiety takes over. Oh my goodness. Whew. Yes. I, <laughs> I've been there there. too. I love, I love that you're asking. These are good, hard questions. You're a good interviewer. <laughs> okay. So because I've worked with celebrities over the last 20 plus years and, and I am very aware, I, you know, I'm born and raised in Los Angeles. So I'm around, I've been around celebrities my whole life pretty much. Um, I know a lot about the behind the scenes of what happens in the private lives of celebrities. And so I've never really wanted anything like that in my life. In fact, if anything, I'm a very, very private person. Not a lot of people know a lot about me on an intimate level, except my clients, because I share the truth about my life as a way to help them see other things in theirs, right? Yeah. And so um, being called, it, the, the yes came through to go to this event with a gentleman named Clint Arthur, who I had a big reaction to, and he knows this already. So I didn't want to go to the event. I felt the yes. My coach said, it's now time to go to that event. And what Clint does is he helps people get on local television. And so during his event, I was so activated almost the entire time because I had such resistance to what he was saying, even though his information is pretty fantastic, it's to be visible out in the world was so uncomfortable for me because I'm more of a behind the scenes person. And yet I'm being called more and more into being in the front, right? Yeah. And so my personal little Marla is like, no, let's just hide out, please. I don't want to go out there. Is right? she British? So, <laughs> I guess she's British. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> That's so um, James will like that. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, the 
the big Marla, the Marla who's living the vision, the Marla who really, really listens, knows that it's part of my path to be more visible in service of others, not for fame and celebrity or anything like that, just literally because if I'm more visible, then the work that's flowing through me can come out into the world, more couples can practice this material. If I'm only working with couples off to the side, you know, behind closed doors, then yes, they're gonna impact lots of people because I work with people like you and James and people who are impacting millions of people, and yet, what's flowing through me has a certain transmission that when it comes directly through me. And so I'm aware of that. And I go through my periods of I need hiding time. I need time, a lot of downtime going to the spa. And I've taken a bath like twice a day for the last week because I'm going through a, a full transformation right now as we speak. I'm being like wrung out from the inside. And so this whole celebrity thing of just being more visible I had a lot of resistance to. And so I had to honor the fact that my little British girl <laughs> was so resistant and like bring her with me. Like, I know it's okay. Let's just do this together. <clears throat> you can kick and scream and we're doing it anyway. It's like good parenting, right? Like you can have a tantrum and when you're done, we're still going to do what I said we're going to do. Totally. Yeah. And I only share that also from my own personal experience with feeling resistance towards things I'm being called to do. Even this show, I initially said no, because we had a lot of things going on. And then I got this big download and spinning class randomly um, that I had to do it. And there were a lot of emotions that I felt too, just like what you're describing, but it's also in service of the dream and it's in service of spreading your message and in service of other people. Like I've heard many coaches say, and I've said it myself, your clients are out there waiting to find you. And if you can't do it for yourself, do it for them. Um, so I think that's really important. So after the break, I want to touch on all of your amazing work around the word exquisite, exquisite honesty, exquisite dark side, <laughs> all of that, um, and get into a bit more about the Dear Marla uh, entrepreneurial opportunity. And so we'll touch on all of those things when we come back from the break. Okay, so we're back with relationship and intimacy expert, Marla Mattinson. And as promised, I want to dive into what Marla calls exquisite honesty. So can you tell us a little bit about that, Marla? Ooh, exquisite honesty. It's one of my favorite, favorite topics. So <clears throat> exquisite honesty is a practice that I developed and practiced in my own relationship. And I teach all my couples where it's not about being honest in terms of saying everything that's on your mind to your partner. It's a very sacred process where you choose something that is upsetting you in some way, something that is activating you in some way, something that even is um, making you uh, even feel joy or anxiety or you know something that's really deeply touching you and you want to share it with your partner as a way to connect. So we do what I, what I call opening the vault. So, you know, you kind of open the vault of what's really going on inside of you to share with your partner. And you do it through this process that we developed where you express what's true for you. And then you get your partner, of course, to reflect back a thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this with me. And then reflecting back some things that they heard so that you actually feel heard. That's a big issue in life these days is that yeah. we feel like we're saying a lot, but we're not really, it's not landing anywhere. And yeah. when that happens in a relationship, it's so damaging because if I, if you and I are having a conversation and let's say I am upset about something and I share that with you and you just go into, well, but I was doing dot, 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 right. And you go into your story about it. <clears throat> I don't feel heard. And so then I'm going to get more elevated in my, in my negative emotions because I don't feel heard. And then you're going to get elevated in your negative emotions because now you're not going to feel heard because I'm going to, your thing is going to bounce off of me like a brick wall. Oh, a brick wall. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and so and for those of you listening on the audio, I, I have a brick wall behind me. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's good to reference that. <laughs> and so <clears throat> to practice this is 
I think one of the most challenging things to do because when you realize, when you have the awareness that something is upsetting you, like it can be something really benign, seemingly benign. Like for example, one of my favorite stories is when Julian, my partner, was eating blueberries in the bed. <laughs> I know you know. I'm laughing because I know this story. Yeah, it's a good one. I love this story, and it was so upsetting. Okay, not because they were blueberries, <laughs> because the way he was eating the blueberries, he was literally he was. I look over. He's like this happy little gnome. He's six foot two, so he's not a little dude, okay? But he is sucking blueberries in, like, you know, it's just putting the blueberry close to his mouth, but then sucking it in, making this really annoying sucking sound. And, but he's got this smile on his face. He's got a full beard. Like, he's a manly dude, but he looks like this little kid, happy as a clam. And meanwhile, I am seething because that sound is driving me insane. I'm very sensitive to sounds. And he knows that, but he's not thinking about it. And, and so he probably thinks it's think, a nice sound. Oh, he loved it. He yeah. was enjoying it. He yeah. loved this. Exactly. He loved the sound. He's enjoying the blueberries. They were frozen blueberries also, by the way. That's weird. I know. It's just <laughs> that's what he's doing. And so <laughs> it's like a little, little frozen snack. And so instead of blowing up and saying something nasty, like, can you stop sucking those blueberries in your mouth? I took a pause. And I said, can I practice exquisite honesty with you? And he was like, sure, babe. You know, he's happy as a clam. And I am holding back like a tidal wave of anger. It's so ridiculous, right? It's blueberries. Who cares? And, <clears throat> and I say, I'm so upset right now because that sound from you, you know. And so I go through the whole thing. And, he, and so I say, so would you be willing to either stop making that sound, just place the blueberry in your mouth, or leave the room and do that somewhere else. Or if you really can't, then I'll leave the room. But that's my last preference because I'm cozy in bed right now. And, she, and he goes, sure, babe. And he walks out of the room, sucks his blueberries, finishes his blueberry sucking. <laughs> Sounds so awful. And he comes back in. <clears throat> and I'm happy as a clam then. And then I'll tell you, I don't know if I told you this, but like 10 minutes later, I did something to irritate him. And he had to share the same with me. <clears throat> and so... But that's the way that we clear yeah. what I call sweep the porch, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. We sweep the porch every day. Yeah. And so every single day, moment to moment, we are current. We are present. One of the biggest issues with couples is building resentment over time. Resentment is wanting something from the past to be different. Mm. The only way it can be different is if you accept what it was from the past. You, you, it, it can't be different with the exception of another technique that we do, but we'll get into a little bit later, the redo. <clears throat> but the exquisite honesty piece is <clears throat> about sharing with your partner the truth about what's really going on inside of you with all your vulnerability, all of your love, and basically revealing, oh my gosh, this is what's true for me. And that's one of the most vulnerable things you can do because then your partner can attack you. Yeah, I think people think that honesty is not like you're not meant to be that honest with your partner because they think that that will do more harm than good. But what you preach is obviously the exact opposite. And I've experienced that because there have been many instances and even periods of months and years where I felt resentment towards James for certain things. and I never shared it. And so it just builds up like you're saying. And so I think people fear being that honest because they think it's going to hurt their partner's feelings or it's just going to lead to another fight. Um, but what you're saying is the complete opposite. It might not feel amazing in the moment. At least that's my experience when you're sharing that or when you're opening the kimono, as you also say. Um, yes. But to be honest on behalf of the union is loving uh, and is the, one of the things that's going to create strength and um, trust in the relationship. Yes, and you mentioned the word union. And so... We have two individuals in a relationship, and then we have the union between the two. And that is like looking through the universal lens of what's best for us as a couple. Yeah. It's best for us as a couple to clear any resentment that's going on. And here's the other truth. We're programmed to lie. On a neurological, biological level, we're actually programmed to lie. Think about it. When someone asks you a question, that you don't want to say the answer to because you're afraid that's going to hurt their feelings or you don't want to deal with their reaction. 
then <clears throat> you're put in this position to say the truth or to just say, oh, no, I'm okay. Oh, sure, Chinese food is great tonight. Oh, yeah, no, we could do pizza tonight when really you're like, mm, I don't really want to do pizza because I really want to, you know. So we're actually programmed to lie. Our first line of internal uh, uh, signal is a defense, is mm. Oop, just you know, fight, flight, or freeze. And that relates to getting defensive or blaming in relationship, right? Or lying, straight out lying. And we lie about little things like, no, that, that blueberry sucking is not bothering me. Oh, it is so bothering me. <laughs> and what would you say to the person who says, well, maybe those little lies are okay. It's the big lies that are the issue. It's so interesting. The big lies are, are truly an issue, right? But the big lies happen because we accept and acknowledge little lies and don't say anything about them. We acknowledge them to ourselves, mm. but we don't use them. We don't realize that we actually can use our fears and doubts and worries to connect with our partner instead yeah. of just trying to work through it ourselves. And also, the other, another thing that we teach is that we can use conflict as a way to connect which is totally counterintuitive. Yeah. Conflict is a way to connect. Conflict, you go apart, you know? It's more that if you are honest in your conflict and you're sharing the real truth about how you're feeling, you're not just off-gassing and yelling and getting upset, that you're actually saying, this is what's really bothering me, right? More than a blueberry story, right? But yeah. even something, uh, I don't like the way that I, you spoke to me the other day. I don't like it. It didn't feel good. That, that conflict, if you use that as a way to connect deeper, that's what sweeps that front porch and mm -hmm. leads to having a resentful, free relationship where there's no resentment building at all. Yeah. So that you can actually feel the current of, oh, now I'm feeling resentment right in this moment. So, and then you can, you know, the, um, the clown handkerchief trick, right? Where they pull a handkerchief out yeah. of something and then it keeps going and going and going. That happens in relationship where all of a sudden something happens and you get upset and you realize, yeah, well, I'm not just upset about that thing. I'm also upset about this and this and this and this. And, and that's what adds to more activation in the moment of a conflict. So when you're clean because you dealt with all of those past handkerchief issues, yeah. you only have to do one handkerchief at a time. So it's very easy to stay current, very easy to stay in love with your partner because you're not building up resentment where ultimately, you know, the downfall of that is if you have too much resentment, you start looking elsewhere for connection. You start looking elsewhere for where can I get fed where I'm not being nourished right. in my relationship. But you can turn towards your relationship even if you have massive resentment. Turn towards yeah. the relationship. I remember there have been many times where um, during our sessions, you know, I mentioned moments where I want to like walk away from James or go in the other room or, you know, leave or whatever it may be, even if just for an hour. And you said that those are the moments where you have to turn in or lean in and have those conversations because I see it now. I see it that whenever we're lying or we're not honest or we're not, you know, sharing what's really going on, then we're separating ourselves from our partner. And it's no longer a union. It's like me and then James over here. And he has no clue what I'm thinking. We're not, we're not paired together in that way. Yes, yes. And uh, just for clarity, for you, I asked you to stay in the room. Yeah, right. It's not true for everybody. Some people really do need space. And the only thing just for your listeners, if you know that you're somebody who maybe gets really angry and needs to off gas a little bit away from your partner, um, the way to do that is you just pause for a moment and say, I'm going to leave and I'm going to come back in 10 minutes or mm -hmm. I'm going to leave and I'll be back in one hour to revisit this. I need space. So to just say it, you don't have to ask for permission. You're telling your partner, this is what's happening because I don't want to stay and get more angry. I need time to calm myself down. Right. So I'm telling you right now, this is what I'm doing and then go do it. But you better be back in that 10 minutes or an yeah. hour whenever you say you're coming back. And if you're not, then text that person and tell them, hey, I know I said I needed an hour. I actually need an hour and 15 minutes. I'll be back in 15 minutes. And by the way, I'm also really working at softening 
and I want to connect with you when I come back and I love you and I'm remembering that I love you. And so there's a way that you can build that softness in, yeah. in the re-entry. So if, if you do have somebody in that, you know, you're talking to that needs space, that it's okay to take space. If you say it and with a time frame before yeah. you walk, does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you for making that distinction. So yeah. the other thing I want you to share a little bit more about is exquisite dark side. Cause we recently had um, a final call with one of our group programs who you've had the opportunity of working with, which has been amazing as one of the guest experts. And one of the ladies shared that exquisite dark side and really owning all of herself has been one of her biggest shifts this year. So I'd love for you to share a little bit more about what that is with everyone listening. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. I haven't that's- told you that. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. The exquisite dark side. So here's the thing, the dark side, I think most people know what the dark side is. Um, it's your shadow side. It's the side that is in the unconscious or the subconscious. It's the part of us that, um, we, <clears throat> that, that sort of like <clears throat> comes up and out when we least desire it to come up and out. It takes over. It's the part of us that gets angry and upset when, um, you know, something happens that we don't like. And, and here's the thing, the exquisite dark side, we all have the dark side. There's one thing that makes it exquisite. And what is exquisite? When you think of it as something exquisite, you're like, it's beautiful. And it's, it, you just want to look at it more and you want to get right. curious. Like, oh, that's like a, mm-hmm. an exquisite piece of art or, yeah. Uh, right. So <clears throat> I like that diamond. Yeah. Yes. And so what makes it exquisite is when you fully integrate it, you own it for yourself. Mm. And so when you fully own your dark side and you are aware, Oh, this, this arises in me. And instead of wanting to cut that out, we integrate it and we use it as a way to connect with our partner. So <clears throat> I did this name that dark side exercise with your group. Yeah. And, and so I'll just share a, a, a couple of my dark side character names and it might help some of the listeners. So I have a Sally know-it-all because <laughs> if you ask me a question, I always have an answer. Yes. And so the, the know-it-all will pop up. So if you ask Sally know-it-all a question, no disrespect to any of the Sally's out there. This is just mine. Sally know-it-all she's going to have an answer. And so I have to watch that my dark side of Sally Know-It-All is not just answering questions that nobody's asking, mm-hmm. right? And that's the part of me that will just, in the past, I don't do this anymore really, but I'll just give advice when nobody's asking for it, right? Yeah, How many coaches go out there, right? And yeah. start coaching people that are not asking for coaching. Don't do that, <laughs> right? Or mm-hmm. controlling constants because I get controlling. I have some control uh, issues. And if you look back in my lineage of my family, you can see where they come from. I was a good student growing up. I learned control. Uh, Betty the blamer. She likes to blame, right? Again, no disrespect to the names. Yeah. And the thing, the cool thing is when both you and your partner start practicing integrating that exquisite dark side and using it, using your dark side to connect more, then your partner can also start to say, hey, can you put controlling Constance away? I'm not enjoying her energy right now. And so Julian yeah. will definitely do that with me. He'll be like, yeah, Constance is really up right now. So I need, usually it's in the car. Part of the reason it's in the car is because, I don't know if I told you this, but I was hit by a car on my rollerblades. Um, oh, wow. No. Many years ago and ended up in the hospital. And, and so I, for a long time, had issues with not being in the driver's seat. And it activated my control issues more because I was like, watch out for that pedestrian. Watch out for this. Watch that. One of the most annoying passengers to be in your car. And so um, I was micromanaging his driving. And so he's like, can you just put controlling constants away, please? And so I know he's a safe driver. He's a great driver. So I had to really calm down and let him control. 
And well, so I it's think been very- even admitting that you have these sides to you is going to be something that most people haven't heard before, because we all know it's there, but we try to hide it. And you're saying, acknowledge it, let your partner know that it exists, <laughs> and then use it to communicate better, to speak honestly to one another. Um, and after the break, I want to talk about how you integrate that into your work, into your um, personal life, into all of your life. Fantastic. Cool. We'll be back in one second. All right. So we're back with relationship and intimacy expert, Marla Mattinson. And now Marla is going to tell us all about how to integrate your dark side into your work and into your personal life. So I'd love to hear more about this. I know everyone else would too. Yes. The dark side, the exquisite dark side, the dark side of course is runs rampant when you try and push it away or pretend it's not there. And when you harness the power of your dark side, that means that you're owning it. Basically, almost nothing, I'll just knock on wood for some reason, but almost nothing can knock me off center at this point because I know my dark side material. I know I get controlling. I know that I have you know, material with, um, being unpleasant at times or being a tyrant or being pokey. Right. And so when I acknowledge that for myself and I don't shame myself for it or feel guilty or bad that I'm acting in a horrible way in life in general, you know, or I'm getting frustrated instead when I say, Oh, I bring awareness and I say, Oh, look at me being controlling specifically in my relationship, that's when I practice what we call the relationship redo. And Mm -hmm. this is how to integrate your dark side. So basically, when you realize that you didn't show up as your best self in the moment with your partner, let's say um, I'm looking at the dishes in the sink and I'm saying to myself, I cooked dinner and he said he would do the dishes and they're still there and I want to go to bed and I don't trust that he's going to get him done, you know, all the storyline. And so instead of being kind and loving and saying something sweet, like, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to bed, babe. And just trusting that he's going to take care of it more often than not, I'll want to just lunge with something a little nasty, like, um, make sure you get the dishes done or Hey, the dishes are still not done. Like a naggy kind of thing. They just won't wash themselves. (laughs) They just won't wash themselves. Oh my God. Right. Who wants to hear that? Now it's just going to be, you know, ugly. And so when I realize, let's say I say, oh, the dishes won't wash themselves. And then he turns around and I see his face and his face is like, yeah, I can see it. What did you just say to me? Right. I can immediately ask for what we call the redo. Oh, babe, can I get a redo on that? And the redo goes like this. It's amazing because you're basically reprogramming your brain in the moment. Okay, so there's no need for saying I'm sorry. There's no need for NLP 10 years from now, reprogramming (laughs) something from the past. You do it on the spot in the moment. You become your absolute best self. You say, babe, can I get a redo? Your partner says, hopefully, yes. And then you both say, you show up with sparkly eyes. You show up with open heart and you say something in the way that is the most loving way you could possibly say something instead of, are they just going to wash themselves? Yeah. So then your partner gets to respond in the, in a proper way that feels good to both of you. And you're literally like actors reenacting a scene as your best selves. And it leads to connection. It leads to deeper intimacy. It leads to reprogramming that ugly little nugget that you would have, um, ruminated on for hours or days or, or weeks gone or to years. bed feeling like that way in that way instead of a positive place exactly yeah exactly and so instead you get to take control of your building resentment and instead of building it you take that resentment down a couple notches yeah. right and again that's part of sweeping that front porch so the relationship redo is one of our favorite techniques And we practice it everywhere. Our little eight-year-old also practices with us too. She'll say, can I get a redo? In fact, the other day, she realized that I wasn't showing up so great. We were picking (laughs) her up from school and she was already in the car. 
And I looked over at her and she said, she mouthed, mouthed the words to me, ask for a redo. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, I like, Love I, it. like my heart exploded, you know? And I went, Oh my, you're amazing. She's amazing. And so, um, I looked at Julian and I said, babe, can I get a redo on that? And he stopped in his tracks and he said, yes. And then after we did the redo, I said, I, I took Zoe out of the car and I gave her a big hug. And I said, actually, Zoe is the one who reminded me to do a redo because we forget in the yeah. moment. It's like we're totally taken over by something that's the dark side. But when yeah. we gain awareness that we're doing it, that's when you can uh, change it. Now, the only, the only caveat is your partner has to be aware of the redo in the moment right. so that they can also change something in them, mm. right? Because you do a redo and you make a change and they don't receive it, yeah. that leads to another conflict, right? So you just have to, and you know, the fastest way to make sure you're doing it properly is to actually get the redo sheet from me. And so we'll, we'll offer that here at the end for all of your listeners. Love it. Yeah, James and I actually did the redo today. Um, so <laughs> I do know it's something that works. It's so good. It's yeah. so good. And it's so easy. And you can do it with everybody. I do it with colleagues. I do it with friends. You know, I had a, I had a, a friend of mine who's a pretty high-level coach say to me, um, oh, I, I asked for a redo on a sales conversation. Wow. He, he did a really crappy sales conversation. And then the next day – he called the person and said, Hey, can I get a redo on our sales conversation? Oh, wow. And he did. I know. I thought, well, that's so cool. Love creative. that. Beautiful. Redo everything. So that kind of segues into something else I wanted to ask you about. So you have said before that you're comfortable being uncomfortable in every way. So that might freak some of the listeners out. They might not understand it. They might avoid feeling uncomfortable. But can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So um, we know what's some, something called the comfort zone, right? Where we're comfortable. And then we know that if you want a new result in your life, you have to get out of your comfort zone. Well, what's not in your comfort zone? I don't know. Something uncomfortable, <laughs> right? So yeah. in order to really make a change in your life in any main area, whether it's relationship or money or health, any main area of your life, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable because all the change, all the greatness, all the like magic of the universe happens when you're not in your comfort zone. And what that means is you're literally uncomfortable. And it can be anything from mentally uncomfortable because you're battling with your thoughts. Like, oh, I can't do this. This is scary, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you have control over your thoughts. You can choose what you want to think. And I know this is part of your mastery. It could literally be something that is physical. Oftentimes, we manifest something on a physical level that makes us physically uncomfortable because we're going through a big change. As I was changing and up-leveling over the last few years, I literally at times <clears throat> felt like I had like an 800-pound gorilla on my chest. Mm, yeah, and I had to lay down in bed, right? And like put yeah. my hand over my heart and my belly and just pray and, and ask for guidance and talk to my say, you're okay. Physically, it was so uncomfortable. Yeah. So uncomfortable. Spiritually, <clears throat> emotionally, right? And then yeah. how do you deal with that discomfort? So I come from a background, I've been, I've been sitting Vipassana meditation for, I don't know, 14 years or something, 10-day silent retreats. And it's probably the most important thing I've ever done in my whole life. Mm. So huge proponent of, um, it's dhamma.org, D-H-A-M-M-A.org. It's all run on service and donation. You can't even donate unless you've served, unless you've sat a course. Wow. So it's, why has it been the most important thing? Because it's taught me how to sit with any sensation that's moving through my body mm. without reacting to it. Mm. That's the whole technique. It's teaching you how to observe objectively yeah what is without losing the balance of your mind. And I think it comes back to what you were sharing earlier about 
you know, us wanting to push away anything that doesn't feel good or any of the dark material or, you know, just anything that we deem um, not a positive thing. <laughs> and but there's so much growth that happens in that space. And even you in the car accident and everything, you know, you and I have both experienced in terms of what the other the world would say would be negative. It's led to so many positives. And, you know, even the things that you've developed, exquisite dark side, exquisite honesty, you know, that probably came, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, through having, you know, interesting yeah. conversations with your partner and going through some stuff that led you to know how to help other people. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And it's, um, it's like if you have a big vision and you have big dreams, you need to train and prep yourself you need to hire someone or join a group, be part of a community that is going to uplift you. You can't be around people and places that are going to drag you down and keep you in your old mindset. And you know this better than most, which is because this is part of what you teach is community is essential. And so, you know, I've spent a lot of money on uh, making sure that I was setting myself up for success in terms of actually breaking through my material. Yeah. Because things that look difficult um, for others, like, uh, let me say it like this. You might look at my life and go, what's, what's difficult about your life, right? It, it seems like everything just flows and goes and, right? And, oh, great, so now you got asked to do a, um, entre you know, a relationship column for Entrepreneur Magazine online. Yeah. What's difficult about that? Uh, isn't that just all great? Well, guess what? From the outside, it might look all amazing, but internally, nobody knows what's going on for me internally except me. Yeah. And it's challenging. It's, it's challenging me to open in new ways and be visible again in new ways. And so never assume that the people whom you're watching rise to the top, you know, uh, are free from this discomfort. They're not. Yeah. If they're truly living their vision and they're by their desire and they're, you know, what's flowing through them, there are lots of moments of being uncomfortable. And then there's tons of moments of total joy and bliss and, and happiness along the way and connection with people who are really on the same path as you, even if they're not at the same, you know, financial level or yeah. success level, that the you have to be willing to say goodbye to people who are not really... Um, supporting what you are doing moving through yeah, the world and it's uncomfortable yeah definitely yeah I don't know any entrepreneur who hasn't experienced that before um but you have to continue to keep looking at your vision and move forward so I'd love to talk a little bit about how you were able to create a life better than your dreams. That's one of the questions I love to ask on this show. And I'm thinking that it does have something to do with money mindset which you just kind of touched on here but I'd love for you to share what you had to transform, what the steps look like, um, how you've created that life better than your dreams. Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> my life better than my dreams. Um, first, I had to listen. I had to really do some deep listening on, you know, when I rolled my car down that canyon, yeah. that was when the deep listening started. <clears throat> and then it kept going. And when I got the message, it's time to resign from teaching. It's not time to take a year off. It's not time to take a sabbatical. It's time to close the chapter mm. on teaching without knowing exactly where you're going. Yeah. That's scary, right? So I had to really, really listen. And so I ended up um, receiving some audio tapes from uh, a friend of mine, from a coach who does this amazing work. And I ended up going to his event and I hired him. And I've spent in coaching and, um, you know, conferences and events and everything well over $500,000 and just in the last couple of years yeah. to, to really invest in myself when I was literally making like $3,500 a month, a month at the most. Yeah. Okay. And <clears throat> I had to really step into who am I? What is possible for me? What is the biggest version of myself that I can actually feel inside of myself mm -hmm. and then move towards that? 
And I had no idea how it was going to work. I had no idea how it was going to happen. I just knew that it had to happen. And so what else do you want to know about it? Yeah, no, I love that. And I think so many people are going to be blown away by the amount that you've spent on coaching. But it's about being in, um, obviously, we go to university and college and we get educated before we start our real job. And it's no different when you're starting a business. You aren't born a successful entrepreneur. And you didn't, neither, I mean, I knew I always wanted to start a business, but it doesn't sound like you necessarily knew that your whole life. Maybe there was an inkling. I don't know. Um, but you, there were some things you had to learn. You had to learn how to transform your mindset in many different ways, including money. And so people think that we're all just born with these skills or it's natural ability, but there's a lot of stuff that we have to learn. Yes. And I, I think one of the big things that I had to learn was to, um, live my life unapologetically. Yeah. I think, I think that was a huge piece for me that I, I kept my brightness on dim for most of my life Mm. for a lot of reasons. And I'd never wanted to outshine anyone. Mm. And I realized that through coaching, that through through receiving coaching, um, that that was not in service to something greater than myself. That was service to old lineage and old cultural beliefs and old beliefs of society, you know, don't shine too bright. Don't be too big. Right. Too much. Well, yeah. don't be too much. Right. And then at the same time, we're asking, I want more, I want more, I want more, but don't be too much. Yeah. So to live an unapologetic life is like, you know, I don't have to apologize for who I am and what I'm doing in the world. Yeah. I just have to do what's coming through me. Mm. That's my responsibility. I'm not responsible for anything else. Yeah, so many people need to hear that and give themselves yeah. permission to live in that way. I think that's a huge piece. Yes, yes. And you live unapologetically. That is one of the things that I love about you. Yeah. And it's, right? And it because it's like um, being uncomfortable, being comfortable being uncomfortable actually starting to enjoy the discomfort. That also is another piece. You know, it's like I, I had to also learn how to overcome feeling like a fraud, yeah. feeling like I had low Me self-worth, too. all my fears, yeah. family objections. You know, my family's really loving, but they also were asking questions like, wait, where are you, why are you doing this? Why are you spending this much money? Right. I want to know more. And it wasn't honestly, the norm. It was not the norm. Yeah. It was not. The norm. And I had to cut off um, the option of talking about my business with my family for some mm-hmm. period of time. It was about yeah. six months. And they honored it, you know, because I'm like, look, I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm just following instructions. So don't ask me any questions about it right now. <laughs> just need space. That's a good answer. <laughs> just, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just yeah. following instructions. <laughs> and anybody that's in any of one of your programs, like, just listen to Emily. Just do what she asks you to do. That's all I'm Don't. doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? So my yeah. final question for you before we move into how people can follow you and um, work with you is, what are you most excited about in your next chapter? Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited about so many things. <laughs> um, I am excited about... Um, Hmm. Well, the first thing I'm super excited about is this Dear Marla column. So I pitched it to them, to Entrepreneur Magazine Online. Wow, I didn't know And they that. said yes. And so we're in the gathering phase right now. And we, um, we posted on Facebook, hey, if you have questions about relationship and business, entrepreneurship, et cetera, either send me a private message or post here. And we got all kinds of question, incredible questions to start with. And then, um, and so then entrepreneur is also going to, uh, have us create some quizzes for entrepreneurs and and relationship because I had the vision that came through me of, I wanted to create a relationship column for traditional business magazine and entrepreneur was the first one. And so that, and then I got another thing going on with uh, someone who's in Australia and serving that community. And so one of the things I'm super excited about is getting this message out there to more people. Yeah. And, and the second thing, 
super excited about is we're creating a group program for high-level entrepreneurs, for mm. couples. So it's a very exclusive uh, group program that's going to be starting in 2018, mid-year. And so that's another thing that is really exciting to me because that's people like you and James who are really dedicated to their business and their relationship and they want to up-level both. So yeah. that's another Amazing. So how do people follow you and find out about both the things you just shared and more? Yes. So you can always go to my website, which is marlamattinson.com. And uh, actually, I definitely encourage everybody to go there because you can get a copy. The opt-in there is the copy of the relationship redo. And it's amazing. So just go, and if you have any questions about it, you can you can send an email through the website to uh, ask a question. And if you, I would love if you have any questions for the Dear Marla column, yeah. definitely send me questions because anything that's true about your relationship, it can be anonymous. We're actually not using names in the column. So, you know, it's kind of like more of a throwback to the Dear Abby, you know, signed, stressed in 2017, <laughs> something, right? Yeah. And so it's, it's really great. So if you uh, have a question, a genuine, intense, lovely, intimate question, definitely send us through Ask a Question at uh, the website and then of course Instagram and Facebook I'm Marla Mattinson and those we'll post um, all the links below as well yeah all I of love that. it and for everyone on the fence about sending in a question if you feel like it might not be relevant or whatever just remember whatever is personal is universal so if you're feeling it I guarantee other people are feeling it so don't be scared like Marla said it's anonymous just send in your question I'm sure that she would love to answer it Definitely, definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Marla. It's been such an honor. And I mean, I've shared with you a million times, but you've been such a blessing in my life and in James's life. And so I'm so excited that all these listeners get to experience you for a little bit of time. Um, but I know that the next chapter for you is going to be really, really big. So I'm excited to see you get even more visible and for more people to experience all your wisdom and everything you bring to the world. Thank you so much. I so appreciate being here. I feel so grateful to be included in this first round of your of your interviews. Yeah. And I'm super excited for you and everything that's going on with you and James and the company. It's incredible. And I'm wishing all of your listeners incredible relationships, intimate, yeah. passionate, and honest. rock business. Yes. yes. And with it, be <laughs> honest. <laughs> Thanks, Marla. And to everyone listening, I'll be back soon with another episode. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to follow me on Facebook and Instagram at I Heart My Life Now. And did you know, I'm on the radio every single day. Visit americaoutloud.com to download the talk radio app so you can tune in at 8 a.m. Eastern and 1 p.m. GMT.